developed and used a code based on their complex, little-known language. Their code talking was critical in winning many battles in the Pacific during World War II. The Japanese were never able to break the code. No one knew about this top secret mission until it was declassified 50 years later. I understood just how top secret it was when I talked to 94-year-old Lieutenant Ray Rodino about his Navy service during the Second World War. So I was just wondering what you did during the war, where, what branch of service you were in, uh, you know, if, whatever you can tell me about that. Oh, I was in the U.S. Navy, and I was a naval intelligence officer, and I chaired a group that copied Japanese code. That means... Four or five uh, uh, mathematicians. I was somewhat facile with mathematics. Uh -huh. And I was selected, and uh, uh, I had four or five people of like kind working for me, or and I, I, they, I was their supervisor. I you see. Might say. I see. And they, yeah. and they worked um, by decoding with mathematical yeah. processes. Did well, they use... yes, that was the secret in the decoding was the uh, the uh, ability you had to. Uh, operate mathematically in sequence operations or many facets uh -huh. that filled in the copying of code. Uh -huh. Separ taking a group of letters or a group of numbers and deciphering them to make them make speak Japanese, which we could translate, of course, but we couldn't break the codes. Uh -huh. And that's what we were trying to do as they were Communicating with their troops and their boats and their ships and right. and such. Oh yeah, we had ECM machines. Right, right. That are, I don't know whether they're still co confidential or not, but we worked. They, we changed the code almost every hour of every day. Ah. So it was very difficult to copy. Right. So where did you work out of? Where were you based? Well, I was for a while. I was at uh, in Philadelphia. And I was in the West Coast, uh -huh. at in San Diego, Valley, San Diego, and San Francisco, and I ended up helping them establish a major communications in Trinidad, British West Indies. I was off Tarawa when we, the Marine Corps brought in the 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 uh, what do they call them? They were they were. Navajo Indians who spoke Navajo to each other oh. and carried on U.S. Uh, uh, orders, but the Japanese could not copy their code. So they, they were the famous Navajo code talkers. Yeah. And you actually worked with them? Yeah, I worked with 25 of them. Yeah. Wow. And were they the original? Of yeah, the oh yes. Of the yes, tw yeah. Oh. There were 35. I don't know how many more there were, but I know there were 35 in our group. Uh-huh. And we were, there were about nine of us that worked with this 35. Right. So Maybe nine or ten people. I, that would fluctuate from time to time. Right, right. But I, uh, from what I know about it, they actually developed the code from their Navajo they language. They developed their own code. Uh, from? In the, Navajo language. Oh, and why was Navajo so... Uh, because nobody could speak it. It was obscure. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, so. And only the Navajos understood it. Uh -huh. Japanese were not Navajos. Right, right. And had no contact with them. Right, and what, was it pretty much an oral language? Uh, they orally, they, oh yeah, nothing was, they orally, they talked to each other. And we would give them scripts. Uh -huh. I wish we wanted them to say in Navajo. Uh -huh. Certain things were going to happen. So was it just that they spoke Navajo? No, to each that other? was the whole thing. They coded the Navajo. Uh, the Navajo uh, language could not be copied. Oh. 
Wow. The Japanese had no way of knowing. Right, what, what yeah. it was. I read something about they developed a, um, a code a, 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 for the alphabet. So oh, they could they, use the it. talkers, yeah. Yeah, the talkers, yeah. right. So how did the talkers operate? Well, they had a leader, usually a Navajo, with uh, intelligence uh -huh. and education, and he would take a group and he would carry on the instructions to the other people, uh, the other Navajos, and tell them what's expected and oversee them. And then we, as naval officers, would oversee them just to make sure things were being done. Right, right. We didn't know what the hell we were saying, anyhow. Right, you, you couldn't no. understand no. the Navajo. No. Uh -huh. So how did they work out in the field? I mean, in the field and just, the war theater. Just had communication methods, either by radio. Uh -huh. And in those times, we didn't have the sophistication of radio that exists today. Uh, they would do uh, uh, fax, and that was a machine, that was a message that came out every day and in code. And then they would do uh, oh, uh, line, uh, machines that were only could be operated in line of sight. And then there were other ones that could be uh, run through the uh, wires and through the elements. What do you mean the elements? Well, the weather. The, I mean, oh, the, oh. the air, the Right. Whatever is going on outside. So uh, one of the Navajo men would be stationed, what, near an office? Three or four would... would be stationed. Oh, uh -huh. On one end of the island, three or four on the other end of the island. Uh -huh. And then they, if the command was at one end of the island and it was directing the whole island, he would tell the Navajos what to tell the other Navajos, and then they would translate it and tell the naval officers and the marine officers what it's expected of them. Oh, yeah. And, and do, was it really helpful or useful? Oh, hundred percent. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent. Drove the drove the Japanese crazy, oh. and we were happy. How, how did you know it drove them crazy? Because after we talked to the people after the war, they wondered what we were saying. Oh, oh. they just could not decipher no. it at all. Now, was there worry that perhaps one of the Navajo code talkers would be captured and tortured to give up the code? Or? Even if they gave up the code, it took a long time to learn oh. how to become a Navajo, oh. how to speak uh -huh. their language. So it was really uh, being so a Navajo. That's another yeah. language that you had to be born and raised as an Indian. Oh. And we didn't... It was, you didn't have to worry about that. Oh, so that was not Now that was one of our se right. secrets and our, uh, you might say, controls uh -huh. that we were happy to have. Right, right. And how were the Navajos selected uh, to be code talkers? Well, nobody knows how that was done. Oh. People visited in mm -hmm. the reservations, interviews, a lot of things went on, uh -huh. and uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps, were, uh, intelligence officers, would go in and talk and interview the in Navajos and find out those who they thought had enough intelligence to be useful. Right. Did they have to have an education? Some did, some did. Uh -huh. Some, it was, you know, just were naturally intelligent. Right, right. Do you think a part of growing up uh, as a Navajo contributed to that? Well, but they had that? schools, I guess. Uh -huh. They had schools on the, on, the, on the reservations. Right. And they didn't teach Navajo. They taught English. And they tried to teach mathematics and the English language and history, just like we had in, in the lay school where you and I went to school. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, growing up Navajo might have meant living out in the desert. Oh, you had to live on the air reservation. Right, right. Did they, like, were they physically very strong or adept oh. or...? But, you know, they're, I thought they were somewhat, uh, well, they didn't like the idea of being on a reservation. They didn't like the idea of some 
whole county being taken over right. and say, near this old corner, you guys can live. But we did those things. Right or wrong, they were done. Right, yeah. Not much before World War I, II, or anything. But Al was the West one. A lot of it was won by putting the Indians in reservations. Mm -hmm. Now, was there any precedent for using that? Well, I was just, that was just a, somebody thought of it, and it was a splendid idea. Oh. And as you said, it worked on 100%. So oh, they were really heroes. Probably a thousand. Probably a thousand. They all got Medal of Honor. Do you think you would have won, we would have won the war in the Pacific? Oh, yes. Right. We oh. were super empower oh. numbers of people. A lot of people don't realize that during World War II, there were only th almost 13 million people in uniform. Oh my God. Yes, I just think they were looking for more power. Uh -huh. When you realize that that country only had a population of 33 million people. They had all of China, all of the islands in the Pacific, and uh, they had attacked Pearl Harbor, of course. So they and they hard. fired, they fired, had two, two times they hit this, our country here, with either torpedoes or something. Oh, where, where did they actually Went up in Washington State, and I don't know where the other one was. Oh, on the West Coast. Oh, on the West yeah. Coast, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so back to the code talkers a little bit. Now, did you knew 25 of them personally? Yeah, I knew them to talk to, but that was all. Oh, uh -huh. I didn't have any great friendship or anything. You were an officer yes. and they were enlisted. I had to do certain things. Uh -huh. And uh, they were all in the Marine Corps. Right. And uh, they all wanted to be an assistant for our country. Oh. And they were always looking for something that they were going to get after. And was it expansion of the Reservation or what? I don't know. Uh -huh. Do they? Well, they considered America their country. Oh yeah, country. that was their country. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they, they were better than most citizens. They were very loyal. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you only knew them to kind of talk to you. Don't, yeah, you, that was. Do all. you have any kind of anecdotes of you know anything that happened that might be you know just of interest? No. Ah. Uh, Probably some things to do with morals that I would pass over at the time. But uh, they were very happy to mingle with the women and have other nice uh, times, I guess you might call them. Oh, okay. Yeah, which was not my way of doing things. Oh, I see. So you, as an officer, you um, you just told them what to do. I mean, did you I actually was told lead them what to class? tell them what to do. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. I my authority was very limited, but I was a vehicle to pass information from the admirals or the commodores on. Uh -huh. Now, now they, this was very top secret special. Oh, nobody knew anything about it. So you would never talk to anybody about it? You would no, my never... wife used to say to me, what did you do with the war? I said, I can't tell you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> that top secret. Now, I, I read that the uh, uh, secret was declassified in 1968. Some were, yeah. some, some of the stuff was declassified, yeah. Right, so, and, and the Navajos uh, joined, uh, uh, they had an association of code talkers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you hear about them or see the, the movie about them? I didn't see the movie. Uh -huh. right. But they, they got congressional gold and medals. Yes, they did. Uh -huh. One of the, the last talker just died last last week or the week before last. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. yeah. So how did you get to be a naval intelligence officer? Because I was so much faster in mathematics and they almost said, you're going to be in the Navy. They didn't say, do you want to join? No. Oh, you You're going to be in. Oh. But I wanted to join anyhow. Oh, did you I didn't want to, want to be in the Army uh -huh. or the Marine Corps. I wanted to sleep on clean sheets. 
And I knew in the Army I might not, and in the Marine Corps I might not. So the Navy, you knew you were going to get green I, That's what I felt with him. Yeah, and, and were you on a, a ship, or were you For on a short times, short times. Uh-huh. And I got sicker than a dog. Oh, God. Did I get sick? So it was not the water or the sea that drove you. It was a sea, but the sea sickness. Oh. Took sometimes took me three or four days to get my sea legs. Oh. Then when I got off the ship, it took me three or four days to get my land legs. I did. Oh. Yeah. But some people can do those things. Uh -huh. I was just one of them that can. Right. So, did you take uh, like intelligence tests with the Navy, or oh no, I did, it was automatically put in with the code machines and such. Oh. And uh, I don't. I imagine they might have checked out my background. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've never seen my file or anything about oh, it. Oh, I see. I never wanted to see it. Oh. So it wasn't a matter of choice as much as they saw yeah. your potential. Yeah. But it would have been a choice. Yes. What do you mean it would have been a choice? If I had to make a choice, I would have gone that route. Oh, oh, oh. So that but they made it for me. Right, right. And thank gosh. Uh -huh. So what was the best job you ever had? Hmm. I guess forming the uh, intelligence agency in Trinidad. Oh, tell us And I was kind of leading some of the groups and setting up coding and stuff, things like that. And uh, it was kind of a vacation. Oh, really? The island, the war was over. Oh. The island was wonderful. Oh. I missed my wife and my son, but uh, I almost had them come down and to live with me. There were, a lot of officers brought their wives and children down the island because they provided cottages for your for the officers. Oh, uh -huh. and uh, and then I forgot. I had told my wife about it, and she was very excited. And uh, and then uh, the FDR a carrier came in and. I could see some of the officers that had come back into the service had been out. I was, I was being held over, and so the war was over. People were going home, but a lot of them were coming back because they could find nothing at home. And the life aboard the military as a naval officer was fantastic. Oh, and what you were waiting it out all the time, and you. Ate the best of food. You drank the best of booze, and you, were, you had people driving you around. And oh. You were like a king, you know. Oh, wow. That was kind of a nice life. But did you wear like a white uniform? At certain times, and I wore a blue one, uh -huh. and a khaki, uh -huh. and a gray. All depends on what the uniform they were. I see. And then, uh, depending on the color of your cap, a lot of things. Anything north. You wore a blue cap in the wintertime and a white cap in the summertime and to cover your cap. I see. And, uh, but it depended on what the uniform of the day was, you wore. And, uh, uh, but as I saw these kind of chaps coming back into the service, and then I saw some of them from the FDR, the priests that had been on, on the midway, they took a photograph of him as the boat was sinking and he was blessing the wounded and the dead, giving him extreme unction. He came back on the FDR and a uh, wonderful guy. Boy, he could eat drink. Woo. And, uh, but then I said to myself, I want to be a lawyer. This is not my life. So I told my wife this. I said, well, I said, I wrote a cute lawyer. I don't know, I made seventh shift. I was going through the seventh naval district and then seventh heaven with her. We had nothing. And uh, I came back home and entered a reserve. Didn't retire from the Navy to become a naval reservist. And uh, went on to law school. And, 
We got to have more children. Where were you living at the time? In uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio. Ohio. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's where your wife spent the war? Yeah, the mother. That's where you're from? Yes. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, uh, those are eras so different than today. Yeah. There was no discussions of sex like it is today. It was rampant today. Then it was unheard of. In the 30s and the 40s, we were entirely different. It was somewhat of a non -anthy. It's just up and fast and I never even think about it. Now all the people go on. And, How long ago was it? Pardon? Your military career. How long ago? Four years I was there. You were there four years yeah. and that was, you said, 70, 70 years ago, yeah. 70 years ago. Well, 42 or 42. I guess it was 42 I was in, yeah. Right. So uh, tell us, uh, did you achieve your two goals? Oh, yeah. You were, you became a lawyer? Where did you go to school? <coughs> I went to Western Reserve University. Oh, in Cleveland? Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. Navy sent me to Harvard. I stayed there two years and got three years education because I went through the summers and uh, being educated. <coughs> and, uh, uh, when I came out of the Navy, I, my wife and I were flat broke and had a child, but we couldn't rent an apartment because people wouldn't rent to children in those days. Oh, if you yeah. had children. Yeah. How old were you then? I don't remember. Twenty-something? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I was almost 22, I guess, when I got married. And then I was married for 65 years. Wow. And it was a romance that you, you couldn't repeat. Oh. It was just a wonderful thing. Oh, tell us more. Oh. I was just, I was in, I, it was just, with her I was, she was everything in my life. I had a goal, faith, family, fortune. That's what I went after. Wow. But I was a young man when I decided that too. And, uh, and I reached the goals that I wanted to reach, I guess. So you were chairman of the? All State Savings Bank. Wow. And uh, uh, that's about my life. Do you think your military experience with the Navy helped you achieve your goals? I know. And yes and no. I'll tell you what it did. It hastened my maturity. Oh, okay. I might have been a, one of these guys. I used to think I was kind of a second half. The first half I'd fail, the second half I'd succeed. I always used to think that a bit. I don't know why. But uh, I think the military made me become a little more mature. So do you think it might be good uh, for any young guy to be I do, military? yes. Why is if that? He's, well, he's got to be, he's got to be open-minded because he's going to have to, as I used to tell my people that work for me, they'd say, oh, this is terrible. I said, no, it's not terrible. You're going to have to eat a barrel of manure before you die. So start chewing on it. <laughs> and you'll get your goals because you'll go up and down. Mm. And when you're down, you're eating manure. When you're up at the top, you're telling the other people how to eat manure. And I, I, you know, I went through probably a lot of hardship, which I never, never carried my job home to my wife. Oh. And, uh, or my children, I don't think. Uh -huh. Ever knew what the hell I was doing. That was sort of separate. Yeah. Much like when you worked with the code talkers. Yeah. But uh, my, and I don't want to mislead you, my activity with the code talkers was not a great deal of my time. It was just, it just hit a short part of my life. I see, yeah. With the military. Yeah, very interesting. Then it was gone, quick. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, Probably they used me for a while because they didn't have anybody else to do put in there or something. I don't know. I never thought that much about it. Mm -hmm. It was just something you were yeah. ordered to do. Yeah. 
Were you kind of surprised later on when oh, yeah. they became very famous? Oh, yeah. Uh, very much so. It was a, a surprise. But... Now, do you think the Navajos were surprised at how famous they became? And I don't know. Oh, you know. It would be hard for Just me. Just opinion. Yeah, yeah it would be hard yeah. for me to suggest their feelings. Right, right. Yeah. Fair enough. I understood as uh, the war was over and that they were strictly very proud of the fact they helped this country. That's what, but that was hearsay. They didn't know what he told me. I was just heard that. Were you proud to have helped your, com your com oh, yeah. country? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was proud of what I got out of it. It was discipline, leadership, skills. Uh -huh. Right. Skills that I probably would have taken a long time to get elsewhere. I got there. Do you think most uh, uh, servicemen after World War II felt the same? I never dwelled on that oh, at all. Okay, you know. I dwelled on myself so? and my family. Uh -huh. That was my whole life. Remember, faith, family, fortune. Fortune. And That's you achieved them all. How wonderful. Tried to. And uh, I probably am the luckiest guy with the poor, lovely children. Because mm. her mother did one heck of a job mm. in raising them. And uh, how long has your wife uh, uh, passed? How long six since years she passed? Wait a She died in 08. Yeah, six years. That's 31st of July. Oh. A loss. Super loss to me. Yeah, I bet. Wow. Many years together. Yeah. So how, uh, do you mind telling us how old you are now? 92. You're going to be 92. 92. Wow. I'm That's 91. Long, I'll be 92 in September. Ah. So World War II is kind of like back there oh, a yeah, long time ago. It. That was just a short time in your life. Yeah. And so you, most of your life has been lived doing other things, being well, a lawyer. Well, I've often done a lot of volunteer work. Oh, tell us about that. And, you know, like I was volunteer at the Huntington Hospital and uh, Boy Scouts as the children were growing up. and. I tried to take part in their lives. I, I don't know how successful I was. But sometimes I think I was not very successful. I was more in, involved with, a, with making a, enough in my life to help take care of my children and myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife was just a super, super, super mother. Oh. How wonderful. What an accolade for her. Well, she told me one time, or she didn't tell me, uh, she knew I was coming home from work. She'd get all the kids to wash them up. And she'd, she herself would shower and get dressed. So I met a fresh family as I walked in the door. And uh, I just thought that was magnificent. And that showed me how much she loved her family and loved her husband. Hmm. That's a wonderful note to end on. It does. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. You're entirely welcome. For sharing this with me. Yes, you're entirely welcome. Probably be the, one of the worst interviews you've ever did. No, not at all. It was extremely good. I didn't even have to ask most of my questions. Yeah. You just told me. Well, anyway, thank you very much, you're Lieutenant welcome. Rodino. Yeah. Daughters. <laughs>